get started. So hi everyone and welcome. My name is Jason Herndon and I'm excited to have you here. Uh, this is a Greensboro bound literary festival event and we are excited to have Elizabeth Child Shelburne, Molly Dektar and Carter, Carter Sickles with us here to talk about their wonderful books. And so we'll start with um, just some quick housekeeping things. Uh, so we will have time at the end for audience questions. And so the way that you'll do that is you'll uh, send them to me in the chat. Uh, again, my name is Jason Herndon. I'll announce this again towards the end when we're ready to do questions as well. Um, but we won't have to do the unmute yourself and ask for a question. You can just send it to me in chat. Um, the other thing is that we <clears throat> just give you a sense of the agenda. We're going to start with um, excerpts from each of the authors and then we'll do some discussion uh, and then we'll open up for questions. So we'll go ahead and get started. Elizabeth, you are first on my screen. So we'll start with you. Elizabeth Charles Shelburne. Lucy Kilgore has her bags packed for her escape from her rural Tennessee upbringing, but a drunken mistake forever tethers her to the town and one of its least admired residents, Jeff the Taylor, who becomes the father of her child. <clears throat> Elizabeth Child Shelburne grew up reading, writing, and shooting in East Tennessee. After graduating from Amherst College, she became a writer and a staff editor at the Atlantic Monthly. Her nonfiction work has been published in the Atlantic Monthly, Boston Globe, Boston Magazine, and the Global Post, among others. She is a graduate of Grub Street's MFA level novel incubator program under Michelle Hoover and Lisa Borders, where her novel Holding On to Nothing was workshopped. She lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts with her husband and four kids aged eight and under, any one of whom will be the death of her depending on the day. Next we have Molly Dektar. When a young woman leaves her family and the civilized world to join an off the grid community headed by an enigmatic leader, she discovers that belonging comes with a deadly cost in this lush and searing debut novel. Molly Dektar is from North Carolina and lives in Brooklyn. A graduate of Brooklyn College's MFA program and Harvard College, she is the recipient of the Dakin Fellowship from the C1E Writers Conference and the Brooklyn College Scholarship for Fiction. At Harvard, she was the recipient of the Lewis Begley Fiction Prize. The Ash Family is her first novel. We are also excited to have Carter Sickles here. Small town Appalachia doesn't have a lot going for it, but it's where Brian is from, where his family is, and where he's chosen to return to die. Six short years after Brian Jackson's move to New York City in search of freedom and acceptance, AIDS has claimed his lover, his friends, and his future. Carter Sickles is the author of the novel The Prettiest Star, forthcoming with Hub City Press in 2020. His debut novel, The Evening Hour, an Oregon Book Award finalist and a Lambda Literary Award finalist, was adapted into a feature film that premiered at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival. His essays and fiction have appeared in a variety of publications, including Oxford American, Poets and Writers, BuzzFeed, Guernica, and the Bellevue Review, Literary Review. Carter is the recipient, recipient of the 2013 Lambda Literary Emerging Writer Award and earned fellowships from the Breadloaf Winner Writers Conference, the C1E Writers Conference, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and the McDowell Colony. He's an assistant professor of English at Eastern Kentucky University. So welcome to all three of you. Again, we're excited to have you. Um, Elizabeth, take us away. Thank you so much for that introduction and for letting us all be a part of Greensboro Bound, even virtually. It's exciting and we're sad not to be there in person, but it's so nice to see everyone. Um, all right, so I'm going to read from my first chapter. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, my main character, Jephtha, um, plays mandolin in a bluegrass group called A Boy Named Sue. And um, he's just had the set of his life after having the worst set of his life. Um, and Lucy, the girl he's been in love with since he was 16, um, is looking at him and is actually complimenting him and looking at him like he's actually something special. No one had ever looked at him like Lucy did then, like she was a kid spying the newest Christmas toy for the first time. He flashed to his mother's face, searching for one memory where she looked at him like he was something special, none surfaced. Rather, her face was lined with the disappointments of having married a man who couldn't stop being mean long enough to direct a little bit of his paycheck toward the upbringing of his kids, rather than to alcohol and drugs and gas for the many affairs he conducted across the county. His mother had never had the time or the inclination to shower admiration on her children. If Jephthah or his siblings had demonstrated any talents, they were more likely to be squashed as a dangerous rebellion against the Taylor norm. 
For generations, his family had worked as hard as they could at doing as little as possible outside of making moonshine, stealing cars, and collecting as much social security as they could con the government into giving them. Jephthah's grandma grandfather had been arrested more times than anyone could count, and his father only slightly less. If there was a break-in, a bar fight, or a drunken accident on the road, everyone in town expected a tailor to be involved. So far, no tailor had killed a person, but it wasn't for lack of trying. His father had been so drunk the day he'd tried to call, he tried to kill Jephthah's grandfather that all six shots he'd fired had missed the old man, who stood stock still, as if getting shot at happened every day. When his dad had thrown the gun away in disgust, the old man shook his head and walked back into the house to finish his drink. Jephthah's mom tried for the first few years to make the future something other than an unedited rewrite of the past. However, by the time Jephthah was born, her spirit had been worn to a nub and her skin to an ever-present mottled green sheen in trying to fight against her husband. And she'd come to learn that putting her head down and getting through each day was best for everyone. It was no way to be happy, but it was a sure way to survive. The only thing she wouldn't concede was church. There was no sin so great that church on Sunday couldn't atone for it. Even though the church ladies like Mrs. Slocum were nice to him, Jephthah had long understood it was only because it was their Christian duty to do so. He'd been 10 when he snuck out of the sanctuary one Sunday and down into the fellowship hall where the church ladies were preparing the after-service snack. There, hidden under a card table covered in a floral paper tablecloth, eating a stolen donut, he had heard Mrs. Gillum whisper to Mrs. Slocum, them tailors now, they's as direct or a buttle of that evolution nonsense as anything, Pastor Terrence says. He is mean as a snake like his dad and his dad before him, and bless her heart, she's dumb as a bag of rocks. Them kids don't seem no better. Ain't a one of them evolving. Everything changed in that moment. No matter what he did, he'd always be a tailor. He'd become a man then, huddled under that card table. He sometimes wished it had made him a different kind of one, but if he was going to be a tailor no matter what he did, he'd quickly decided he might as well enjoy the reputation. He'd stopped trying in school, dropped out as soon as he could, and got his own visits from the sheriff. He'd gone to church with his mama until he was 17, but when she died of lung cancer that summer, he'd looked around during the funeral service and realized that no one much cared if he came to church anymore, nor did they much want him there. It was much easier to hate the sin and love the sinner when he wasn't standing among you every week. For the last five years, he'd worked only when he had to, drunk as much as he could afford, and taken advantage of the loose morals of any number of girls named chastity and honor. He reckoned he'd been as happy as any tailor could expect to be. But now, drinking in the look on Lucy's face that made him remember his name was Jephthah, not just Taylor, his sweaty fingers cradling the neck of his mandolin and just the way his hand wanted to be holding the back of her neck, he understood for the first time in his life the value of giving a damn. I can't. I can't hear anything. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> only the host can unmute people, so I will not mute myself again. <laughs> okay, so uh, Molly, why don't you uh, take us away? Oh, you also can't unmute yourself. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> sorry about the muting. Thank you so much for the wonderful reading, Elizabeth. And um, thank you, Jason, for having me. It is such a pleasure to be here. Um, I grew up in Durham, not far from Greensboro, and some of my Durham family is here. So it's really such a, I'm just honored to be a part of Greensboro Bound this year. I'm going to read from the very beginning of my novel, The Ash Family. It looks like this, recently out in paperback. I really love the paperback cover. Um, and this, because it's the very beginning of the book, hopefully it basically speaks for itself, but um, it's the first glimpse of the farm where the Ash family lives. And the book centers around this young woman, Barry, who's left home to join this off the grid farm. And, um, and this is right as she arrives there for the first time. 
Faye and I approached the farm at dawn. The first sun churned sideways through the trees, catching in the previous day's rain, which the wind now shook down from the Carolina silver bells, the beaches, and the poplars. I rolled down the window and heard the forest fizzing. Faye had taught me one of their songs in the car. Come, my soul, and let us try for a little season. Every burden to lay by, come and let us reason. He sang the harmony and drummed his thumbs on the wheel. I couldn't hold the melody and my voice kept slipping. Before I met Dice, before I met Queen and Pear, he was the whole Ash family to me, and I promised him, my soul with which I would try. We repeated the song till I could maintain my line. When we turned off the paved road, the, the low sun lit up every strand of his hair so that as a result of its extreme disorder, it looked like a giant bright halo. He had rescued me, I thought. Bay drove maybe a mile more up a road so bumpy that my head kept hitting the ceiling. We passed four signs warning hunters not to come near. Beware, large dogs. Here, he said, we're here. In an instant, the gold light broke, and here was my first view of the farm. The house crouched in a whirl of yellow leaves from the biggest hickory I'd ever seen. The wind spun the leaves in the air as thick and self-contained as the liquid in a snow globe. I felt like my eyes were failing. I stumbled out of the car. Bay took my hand. I'd gotten a splinter in it the day before, and I felt like he'd shoved a stake through my palm. A light went on in the house. On our trip up through the mountains, Bay had told me that I could stay at the farm for three days or the rest of my life. His family, intentional family, not born family, sustained itself communally off the grid in the old way. This was the real world, he explained, and if I stayed, I'd get a real world name to replace my fake world one. He said I would come to understand that there was no definite self. In the Ash family, there was no selfishness, so there were no possessions, no children, and no couples. What if I stay longer than three days but want to leave after, I said. Why would you want to leave when you'll have more freedom here than anywhere else, he said. The family's father, Bay said, was Dice, and Dice would understand me the way a lightning bolt would understand a rod. I was ready to believe it, all of it. Bay could see, as no one else had, the yearning I felt for a more essential life. To me, essential meant a life more connected to wild nature. I'd always known there was magic on the margins. There was a world beyond my mother's world, where a dinner that went off without a hitch meant a dinner where no one talked about anything that mattered. My ex-boyfriend Isaac told me that my desire for a more essential life was meaningless unless I was fleeing from and fleeing toward. I'd had so much trouble discerning the toward. I was looking for the toward. Then I met Bay. Next to him in the yellow winged morning, it seemed to me that everyone in Durham had told me just what I'd needed to leave them behind. The hickory leaves pattered against our backs and adhered to the house's clapboards. Will I meet Dice now? I said. Not for a little while, I think, said Bay. Let the fake world fall away. His arm was around me and I watched his breath enter the air. The cold had broken records for September. I didn't know where I would sleep, what I would eat. I had no money and no possessions. Three days or the rest of my life, I thought. We stood listening to the leaves, the sheep's plaintive calls, the cow's exasperated moos. A white dog lipped toward me. It was huge, almost my height, and butted its head into my chest. Let me see your watch, Bay said. I held out my arm. He unbound the watch from my wrist and slipped it into his pocket. I liked the feathery feeling of his fingers on my arm. Then he pulled away from me. Stay, he said as he walked into the house. At first, I thought he was talking to the dog. I stood alone in the courtyard under the shutting yellow tree. I could hear a whippoorwill in the creaking trunks of trees. Across from the house, the L-shaped barn filled up my vision from end to end dim against the glare of the sky so its detail only gradually appeared, a dusky bronze color with a tiny tower on one end, topped with a tin wind arrow, slowly turning. Between house and barn, there was a storage house on crooked slate stilts with a triangle roof like a child's drawing. Mountain slopes rose on two sides, holding the buildings like a folded palm, what I would come to know as the hauler. It was all tidier than I'd imagined and older. I'd expected tarped buses and pelt teepees leaning in the woods, but this was a quiet old fashioned farm tucked into standard pastures. The wind streamed down the slopes, eddying and rumpling in the longleaf pines and on the weather vane, so that it turned this way and that, not indicating anything. Thank you so much, Molly. Carter, um, I think we fixed it so you can all unmute yourselves and mute yourselves 
at will panelists. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jason, for the intro. And thank you, Greensboro Brown Bound. It's great to, to be here virtually um, and, and wonderful to read with Molly and Elizabeth. Um, so my novel is The Prettiest Star. You can see there with um, all of my tags. Um, and the novel uh, takes place in 1986. And Brian Jackson has um, been living in New York. And he, uh, he's a young queer man who is now um, sick with AIDS. And he returns back to his small town in Ohio, in Appalachia, Ohio. Um, and his family, his parents wanted to keep his sexuality and his status uh, a secret uh, from everyone in the town and the family. So I'm going to read kind of like, I guess, a quarter of the way in. And it's just a short scene with Brian and his grandmother. And his grandmother, who he calls Mama, is sort of the only person in the family who really kind of supports him. Um, and uh, this is just a scene where they go to the mall in a nearby town. Um, and uh, I think that's all you need to know. June 30th, 1986. Today, Mama picked me up in her Crown Vic, tequila gold shining in the sun, washed and waxed, and said we were going shopping. She loves to drive, always has. She used to drive all over the hills of Ohio, hawking her wares. It wasn't easy to sell beauty products in Appalachia, but my grandmother was a hell of a saleswoman. Usually, the lady of the house would invite us in, offer us a glass of Coke. If Mama ran into any trouble making a sell, then she'd get me to sing a Dolly Parton number. My cuteness usually nailed it. You have a special way of seeing the world, she used to say, like her brother, the one who was killed in the war, a young man who never had a girlfriend. Whenever she talks about him, she gets tears in her eyes. He was a good man, she said. When I left Ohio, my grandmother understood. She told me to live my life, but I also saw the hurt in her eyes. I'm scared for you, she said. I told her I'd be back soon. Now I want her to take care of me, but how can she if she doesn't know? When I was growing up, she laughed at jokes about homosexuals. We all did. Since I've been here, she hasn't said a word about gays or AIDS. We went to the mall in Madison. She wanted to go in every store, stopping to look at all the window displays. Oh, look how cute, she'd say, pointing out ceramic puppies, a mug with a bunny on it, a pair of tiny red Dorothy slippers. She touched things. She picked up a container of potpourri and gushed, oh, don't this smell good? After an hour or so, we took a break, not for her, for me. She pretended she needed a rest too, but she wasn't winded at all. I hardly remember how things were during the before, when I never had to think about breathing or walking or running any more than I did about eating or sleeping. Those were just things the body did without pain, without effort. Now the shortness of breath comes and goes. My body, I want the old one back. We sat on a cement Brent bench next to it the center fountain, in, sorry, the bottom lined with pennies and nickels. I dipped my hand in. The water was cold and clear, smelled like metal. When my grandmother saw a couple of ladies she knew, she waved big. This is my grandson, Brian, she tells them. He's back from New York City. New York, they shook their heads with wonder, eyes looked, locked onto my earring. Both were squat, boxy, with short, stylish hair. Dykes, I thought, but of course they had husbands at home kids and grandkids. One wore a loose t-shirt with Mickey Mouse on the front so long it fell almost to her knees and the other had on a plain blue Oxford worn out at the elbows. They've probably never been out of Ohio. They have everything they need here. Why go anywhere else? After they left us, Mama opened her change purse, the same one she's had for years with a little copper clasp that fastens together. She handed me a penny and took one for herself. Make you a wish, she says. I flipped the penny in, and when I opened my eyes, it had already sunk and joined the hundreds of others, all those drowned wishes. I'm scared, Mamma, I wanted to say. Make me better. We went to Sears and walked through the ladies' section where a few women browsed the sale racks. Watching them, hearing the click of the plastic hangers, I felt nostalgic. When I was little, I used to crawl under the racks of clothes, slipping between dresses and slacks as Mamma read price tags aloud and touched the material to see if it was well made or not. We rode the escalator up to the men's department, even though I told her I didn't need anything. It's my money, she says. Look here. They're having a sale on tops. She sent me over to a table of shirts and told me to hold out my arms, and a salesman with puffy blonde hair came over and asked if we needed any help. 
He was probably in his mid-30s, tiny lines around his eyes. He wore silver rings on his fingers and spoke with a predictable lisp. I gave him a smile of recognition. You can spot your own. This one, what a Nelly. I told him we were just looking. If you need anything, just holler, he says, voice all bright and gay. He said his name was Andrew. My grandmother, Chatty, told him all about me, her grandson home from New York City. Andrew gave me the same knowing look I'd given him. As he hovered, jabbering about upcoming sales, I started to feel like I couldn't breathe, the factory smell of new clothes and cheap carpet, the swirl of cologne. I was suffocating. I needed to get the hell out of there. That's a good color on you, he says, as my grandmother held up a blue shirt to me. She goes, matches his eyes, doesn't it? Then the phone rang and Andrew excused himself. He touched my shoulder before he whirled away. I felt relieved to see him go. I can't explain it really, the sudden sticky shame. It wasn't about being queer, not exactly. I felt disappointed in myself. I left, I left this town so I wouldn't have to live this way. And now here I was back in the closet, walking around in skin that's not my own. What a nice fella, my grandmother says. That's the end of that scene. <clears throat> Thank all three of you so much for your uh, great readings. So I wanna jump in. I think one of the unifying themes, right, of, of all of your works is, is setting, right, particularly in Appalachia. So what originally attracted you to wanting to write stories sort of set in these communities and in this sort of region? I should probably pick up. So. Molly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it, it was all about the nature when I was younger, going out to Western North Carolina, the mountains are really, really old there, of course, and so they're very gentle. And um, it was a part of the world that was never iced over in the last ice age. So there's incredible biodiversity, but there's a subtlety to it too. You know, like the American West and California have more drama, kind of. But part of why I wanted to write about North Carolina was love for my home state. And then another reason is there are many of these off the grid cooperative communities in Western North Carolina. There are many, you know, idealistic sort of hippies and there's um, back to the land schools even. And um, I was reading Wild Fermentation by Sandra Ellis Katz and reading about um, his work in sort of foraging and the, that on um, all the natural goodness of the mountains and so on. So I was really interested in the idea of writing about a commune and a commune on the edge of a cult. And so the confluence of my interest in exploring my home state and where I'm from and in writing about that kind of community, just it was really natural to write about Western North Carolina and I can't imagine how the book would have worked anywhere else. Yeah. Elizabeth, how about you? Um, I just want to say, Molly, I spent a lot of time in Western North Carolina, and right now, an off-the-grid community sounds... I, you know, I, I don't feel like I really have to write about any... any where I'd grown up in the place I knew the best, and I, um, I think at some point... I, 20 years behind where I actually am in my life um, when it comes to where I'm writing about. So um, I, you know, at some point I, as I'm living it now or some version of it, but um, so far all my stories, Tennessee and about where I grew up and the people I grew up and I think, um, you know, childhood and all um, older but, um put this place that I knew so well and loved so much on the page um, in all of its kind of complexity. There's a lot of um, good and, you know, and but people obviously all over the world and, and East Tennessee too make bad choices. And I just wanted to kind of show that place and those people um, as I'd known it. Growing up. Yeah. Okay. Carter, how about you? Yeah, um, I, I think a couple of things. I mean, I was thinking about um, writing about the AIDS epidemic from the, that time period of the 80s and 90s. And those stories are usually set in urban um, spaces. And so I, I really wanted to look at like what was happening with AIDS in rural spaces um, and kind of, and I'm, and I'm always sort of interested in queer 
stories in rural spaces. I think that it's um, often overlooked. And then I grew up in Ohio, um, but most of my, I grew up kind of central Ohio, but my grandparents and a place that feels really special to me is, is Appalachia, Ohio. And for some of the same reasons that Molly was saying, it's a really um, beautiful area. It's this sort of um, strange corner of the state that a lot of people don't know is there. The rest of Ohio is very flat, but this part, uh, we don't have mountains, but it's, it's very hilly. Um, and it's also a very sort of isolated place. And so it has this kind of beauty of the natural world, but it also can feel um, very isolated and oppressive. And so I wanted to show Brian in the space where he felt um, the oppression of um, the town and he felt um, the stigma of, of being queer and his HIV status. Um, but also there's this kind of, um, balm or like healing part of the, of the natural world around him as well and kind of explore that. Yeah. You know, Elizabeth, you mentioned something around sort of the ways in which stories about Appalachia are told, um, sort of how folks there are characterized or that type of thing. So as, as a reader who doesn't know a ton about Appalachia, um, something that I was sort of curious about for all of you was in what ways were you seeking to sort of highlight maybe some things that folks don't know about these different places? Um, maybe in what ways were you looking to maybe highlight some of the, the issues, right, facing these various communities? Um, maybe some like internally caused, maybe some externally caused. Um, and then also, when were you looking to subvert right? Expectations around um, stories set in Appalachia and the people you would find in those stories and what they did and what they thought and how they behaved. Uh, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I, I mean, my book has a lot of, um, and people have asked me about this before, like there's bluegrass music, there's alcoholism, there are people who are working um, you know, jobs at Walmart or in bars, like, um, so there are some, you know, sort of Appalachian tropes at work there. Um, but my goal was to try to get underneath and um, really, you know, really explore the characters and the people and what their lives are like um, underneath that. And so for me, I, you know, Jephthah is a, is a bluegrass musician because it's the one thing he has that's good. It's the one thing he he truly loves, um, and it's the one thing he's really good at. Um, and so it's sort of like his mom, when he's playing at um, Carter's Fold once, um, you know, his mom says that God God gave him this one gift, and that was his his one thing that he got. Um, and so I, that's why he, but also because I love the mandolin, and I wanted to just sort of immerse myself in that world a little bit. Um, and for Lucy, you know, she's just really had a, a tough life and, um, you know, her parents die when she's 13 and she's just kind of made her way through the world and have, she has big goals and big dreams, but she doesn't, it's hard to achieve them. I think she just does not, you know, she didn't get dealt a hand where it was easy to, to leave or easy to, um, to, you know, improve her life from what it has been, um, although she would like that. And so I wanted to sort of stay in that world, but look at those um, what might feel like stereotypes or tropes and think about the characters and the people um, underneath them and sort of how they were, um, how they might feel true, but often how they, you know, they miss a lot, right? That's the, you know, we miss, the, the, the stereotypes are really broad <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. and you miss all the, the truth underneath and the complexity of the people. So I think that's what I was trying to do was just sort of show this place that I'd grown up in, um, in all of its complexity. Carter, how about you? How did this work for you? And yeah, mute. Um, yeah, I think you know, some, in some ways, with this novel, like the year feels so critical, which is 1986, um, because of what was kind of happening in America and the way um, there was such a failure from the government and the media and families and churches toward people um, who were HIV. Or who, HIV positive or who were struggling with AIDS and dying from AIDS. Um, so the year felt really critical. And in some ways I feel like this story could take place 
in any small town across America because the homophobia was just so sort of entrenched and there was so much anxiety about fear and fear about AIDS and, and queerness. Um, but I, I feel like this, as I said, this part of um, Appalachia is a sort of neglected and overlooked area. And so I guess I wanted to examine those oppressive attitudes and um, and 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 the kind of um, stigma that Brian feels, and the isolation that he feels, and also just I mean the violence there um, toward queer people, um, but also um, show you know these compar characters with compassion. So like his mother, for example, who can't really let go of her homophobic ideology that she's. Um, been raised with, but um, I try to write her from this place of compassion and show her as this fully complicated um, character and show some of the other characters in this town, you know, so that they're not just stereotyped as like ignorant small town um, characters. And I think Andrew was a way for me to really think about that because he is, um, he becomes, so he's the guy that he meets in the store and he becomes a character um, a, a bigger player later in the novel and he becomes kind of steps in as part of Brian's like chosen family and he's a small town gay you know he's never left um, but he um, is, is very nurturing to Brian and kind of steps in and takes care of him and his own mother um, I think is also complicated she has a very small part in the novel um, but I, I hope that she kind of subverts this idea of what um, Appalachian, um, you know, an Appalachian character would look like as a sort of uneducated or ignorant um, person. So I tried to really make it complex through the characters, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Molly, how about you? Yeah, um, I think that in writing about Appalachia, one of the, the really, the motivating force behind the cult in my novel is this concern about climate change. And um, Appalachia has been, of course, um, profoundly damaged by sort of mountaintop removal mining and various other forms of mining. Um, and then at the same time near Asheville, where my book is set, um, there's been, they paved all the roads and they made them really nice. And now there are all these new developments and in places that used to be really um, about, you know, small holdings, farms, and so on. There are these sort of McMansions. And I had a very odd experience when I went down there and I was working on a farm and um, the farmer and I drove to a new development and the ground was very spongy and covered in new grass that had clearly all just been sort of sprinkled in and laid out to make the housing development look nice. And I thought about how mountaintop removal mining companies are required to restore the nature after they blast the top of a mountain off. And um, they sprinkle grass seed on these sort of scorched, terrifying looking landscapes. Um, and that's, that's how they fit their requirement to restore um, the, the land to as it was. It's a joke. I mean, it's um, really upsetting how, um, how much they wreck um, the biodiversity of these communities. Anyway, so in, in writing about Appalachia, I was thinking a lot about what, how to make climate change feel really personal for my characters, because it's this gigantic thing, it's in the future, it's gonna affect all of us. It's really hard to know what to do as an individual. And having them, um, there are certain scenes where they go do direct actions on the mountaintops, but in general, they're living off the grid as a way of living in protest against um, contemporary society. And so that felt very much wrapped up with the, the many threats um, that are affecting Appalachia. And not to see it through rose-colored glasses, I mean, if more prosperity, I suppose, you know, it's a mixed blessing at times. And where the Ash family is located, it is becoming increasingly prosperous. So that was one of just many um, pressures, I suppose, on Barry and her her comrades in her commune. Yeah. You know, I think one of the common threads between each of your works also is music, right? And so Elizabeth, right, for you, it was bluegrass music and uh, Carter, for you, it was like 80s pop music, specifically David Bowie. 
Um, and then Molly, for you, it was sort of the songs that the cult came up with, right, and sung. Um, so tell me a little bit about, like, what does the music in your story sort of, like, add to them, or what does it symbolize? Uh, Carter. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I grew, I was a kid and teenager in the 80s, so, you know, I wanted to capture the, the time period and, and the texture of that, and for me, I remember, you know, it was like MTV was sort of new and exciting. Um, everyone was walking around with walk bands or boom boxes. <laughs> and so music was sort of everywhere. You were making uh, mixtapes all the time. And, um, and, I, and so it was a way for me to kind of immerse myself in that world, uh, in those memories and to kind of get back to that time period. And then David Bowie really emerged as, um, um, you know, the Brian, um, you know, hero and the music that he listened to when he was younger, which would have been the 70s. Um, and, you know, I think Bowie is just this iconic symbol of like freedom and queerness and weirdness and flamboyance. And it gave Brian a way to think about the world outside of the confines of his small town. Um, and, then, and then as I was working on the novel, I was a couple of years into it, was when David Bowie died. And so, um, yeah, it just um, hit me even harder. You know, I was like, it just resonated more. And I was reading a lot about Bowie's life, and, but especially about the influences that he had on um, young people across uh, the world, really, but um, in America and small towns. And, and so um, it became a way for me to even shape the novel and, and title the novel. The title comes from a David Bowie um, song. Um, and it, so I think it was like a way, a lot of the research I was doing and a lot of, um, you know, the material is, is a lot of trauma and, and difficult about um, how many people were sick and dying of AIDS. And so the music was like, um, I don't know, I added some joy, I thought, to the writing of it and I hope um, to the reading too. Yeah. Molly, how about you? How did you come up with these songs? Well, I love this question because I can talk a lot about the music and the Ash family. <laughs> I won't talk that much about it. But a lot of the songs that they sing are part of the sacred harp tradition or also known as um, shape note singing. Elizabeth is nodding. <laughs> I'm glad that I, I love sacred harp singing so much. It's um, a, a very old fashioned, popular in the 19th century communal a cappella singing tradition. There are four parts. The harmony structure is really different from um, normal church music. I mean, a lot of the, the lyrics are very like Christian and they're really about um, accepting that you're going to be eaten by worms after you die. You know, there's a sort of grotesque old fashioned religion to them. Um, and then the way that the harmony is, it's called dispersed harmony. So instead of many um, thirds sort of rising and falling like an organ, it's um, a wild kind of broken sound. And I love, I mean, I just love this kind of singing, but the reason why I put so much of it in the book is it seems, it to me is very similar to um, subsistence farming in a way, and also to this communal um, thing that the Ash family is trying to do, because there's no leader. The leaders rotate out, and when you're the leader, you sit, you are standing in the middle of the, square of surf of the singers and you get the best um blast of sound from all sides and when i worked on farms in the past like when we sold at a farmer's market then they would get the best tomatoes and we would have like whatever the wrinkled old tomatoes were less and the ash family on the other hand because they're trying to be their own little tight community they as um, someone says in the book the worker reaps the best rewards and this is a big part of their ideology kind of this is why we're separate, separating off from society. And, um, you know, we're able to have a special view on life because um, we're focusing on this leaderless community thing, so they say. And as a matter of fact, you know, sacred harp singing, you can do it in many places around the country and even around the world. It's sort of like contra dancing, you know, people do it as a hobby. And um, it's a wonderful, you could almost call it like an anarchist kind of community because you don't go to school for it. People teach each other all voices are welcome and that kind of thing. 
so um, in the Ash family in general, I wanted it to be sort of evenly balanced between a wonderful community that you would want to live in and a terrifying community where people are getting murdered and so on. And um, definitely Sacred Harp comes down on the side of wonder and beauty um, that I wanted to portray in the book. Yeah. Elizabeth, how about you? Um, well, like I said, the book has a lot of bluegrass and a lot of Dolly Parton. Um, yeah. Like Carter's book, it it's also draws its title from a song from Dolly Parton's song, Holding On To Nothing. Um, and originally the, the title of the book was actually Little Sparrow, which is another song that um, comes up in the book. Um, just felt like that was a little bit more sort of Lucy's song, not Lucy and Jephthah's song. So um, in the course of publishing, we were looking for titles and Dolly Parton had through your brain ever <laughs> so we um we just we found holding on to nothing it worked really well um so i just i you know i think i um grew up going to carter's fold the carter family fold and um grew up just hearing a lot of music and listening to a lot of music and really wanted to um bring that into the book um and i knew quickly i was a musician um it just was sort of part of who he was from the beginning of the character um and i just i love to that music. I didn't as much when I was a kid when it was everywhere and surrounded um, me all the time but um, when I left I really missed it because it was just sort of in the air you didn't have to love Dolly Parton when you lived in Tennessee because she's everywhere <laughs> um, but you know when I when I left I I sought out that I sought out bluegrass and and Dolly much more um, so I just I wanted to kind of keep that um, keep that in the air and it's sort of like music in some ways um, in some places is just sort of in the, in the air. You don't sort of, you're not consciously listening to it. Carter talks about, you know, everyone listening to Walkman's. It's just sort of was all around. And so I wanted to kind of infuse that into the book as much as I could. Loved it. So again, I think a thing that I found really fascinating, again, about sort of this common thread through all of your works is this uh, sort of play between your sort of birth or actual family um, and your found family. And so Molly, let's start with you. I think I was almost, I was a little surprised by, it, it's funny to me, you call her Barry. I think of her very much as Harmony, um, so if that says something, but um, how eager she was to fall like under the sway of this place. And so, Talk to me a little bit about sort of like how you see that difference, right, between sort of family and found family or chosen family. Yeah, I mean, Barry, um, she's a complicated character because she's not, there's no huge motivating thing in her life that causes her to want um, to escape. There's no, you know, terrible trauma, I would suppose, in her past. Her mother and her boyfriend in Durham, the people that she leaves forever, um, are, you know, caring and limited in their human ways. Um, but what the Ash family offers to her is really, she feels like they are more in touch with transcendence and something kind of holy and also a certainty that really matters to her. So they use that language of chosen family, um, which is, you know, a big part, I think, in activist circles and different communities. Um, and they use, I mean, they, I intentionally um, gave them a lot of, um, a lot of the kind of cues that would signal to her that this is a safe place to be and a good place to be. So then as the plot carries on and her view is increasingly twisted as she commits more and more of herself to the vision of Dice, who doesn't always have, you know, the best interests of his family at heart. Um, there, you know, she has to basically decide how far she's willing to go to pursue this vision of living in unison with nature. And so, yeah, I still, I mean, this book, it took a long time to revise. And I think a lot about what you raised, the question of how, how can I show that yearning and that, as, as I put in the part that I read, she's fleeing from and fleeing towards. And the from isn't so bad. It's really the towards that's the, that magnetic pull, the idea of being really understood by people. And as for her having her name changed, um, I was researching, you know, many, I'm just, I find cults incredibly fascinating and reading on message boards. And this is pretty universal that people are given a new name when they join a community like that. Um, and so there's a way of saying, you know, you are, as you said, reborn into it. 
um, and you've become someone new and it's part of the manipulation to cut you off from the people who do love you on the outside. Um, so yeah, once again, it's kind of an ambiguity in the way family is treated in the book, but certainly it's a key part of what attracts her and, and has her then committing more of, more of herself to it. Yeah. And so Carter, similarly, right, in your story, you have um, Ohio, right, which is where Brian is from, that's where his family lives, and he's also sort of fled and gone to New York, which is sort of where all of his, at least for a time, all of his chosen family are. Um, so yeah, talk to me about sort of this found family, you know, real family, biological family, I should say biological, not real. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I wanted to tell this story about Brian returning to his biological family or his family of origin um, and, and how complicated that can be for a queer person who often is kicked out of their homes or, you know, maybe not kicked out, but certainly not welcomed or accepted as their full, uh, true, authentic self. And I think, um, I mean, I think that queer community has has been creating like queer families and chosen families probably since the beginning of like queer community and kind of redefining what home and family looks like just because so many people were rejected by their own biological families. Um, and so the book, yeah, it's taking place in Ohio with his biological family, but I have his best friend Annie who lives in New York, who is, you know, his queer family um, come back. And then I think Andrew, the guy at Sears also becomes a part of that um, chosen family. And so that felt really important for me to include those characters in Brian's life and include those characters in the book. Because I think um, especially during that time in the 80s and 90s, like queer families were, were critical um, because people were stepping in to take care of their lovers and their friends um, in the ways that they're you know, biological families were not doing. So since the book wasn't taking place in that space where, where Brian um, fled to, um, I still wanted to kind of bring a few of those characters. And, and then I think what happens is that it becomes this um, new family that, ha that includes a few members of his family of origin, but also uh, his friends. And, and they are, I guess, one of the questions that the novel looks at is sort of these different ways of taking care of people and nurturing and and asking, you know, like, how are we gonna take care of each other and who is gonna kind of step up um, to do that? Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, you know, you too in your work, um, the Taylor legacy is sort of so ever present, so overwhelming for Jephthah specifically. Yeah, he's really, you know, Lucy's kind of weighted by expectations of what her family hoped for her and what she could do and what the town hopes for her and what she might do. And, and Jephthah is definitely burdened by his reputation. Um, you know, I think even, um, even when he um, makes good choices and is trying to, um, when he stops drinking and is really trying to kind of be the sort of man he always wished he could have been, um, but he's never had any kind of model for, um, but that he, when he, when he is trying to do that, no one in town believes that it will take, um, he really, no one can do it. Um, so yeah, the Taylor legacy is that, that idea of that family. I mean, I think, you know, uh, at the case in a lot of places and especially in small towns, but um, certainly where I grew up, like that idea of, well, who's your family, um, you know, is really, a, <laughs> you ask a lot and for, um, for Jephthah, just having to say, oh, you know, the Taylors, well, that's, you know, your, your ticket's already written. And unfortunately, it's not a good one, you know? So I think um, I wanted to show him wrestling with that and trying to, trying to get past it and being pulled back, not because of his family, but because he personally struggles with alcoholism. And that's just really hard. For me, part of it was that idea between what your family ex expects and what you as an individual can do. Um, and so there, that tension between the family and the individual, I think. Um, and, and, you know, and they were lucky not um, loved uh, the, the sort of found family that you created, Carter, for Brian, um, particularly at the end where there's that larger group of people really taking care of him. It was so beautiful. Um, and so my characters don't have as good a group as that because he really 
there at the end came, there was just such a love there between those, those people, but they have, you know, other people that they found in their lives through their jobs or, or people they live with and um, who love them and who, um, you know, are, are trying to help and be supportive. Because, you know, I think what you realize with any character and any person is that we all need, like, um, we all need people around us in some capacity. Some of us need fewer than others um, or more than others, but we, but we need that. Um, so wherever we can find it is, is good. Um, so I think it's hard too with characters, right? Cause you want to pull their, um, pull their crutches away from them and make life harder for them. Um, but also make it so they're not just the lone person out on their own. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, to stick with you, Elizabeth, you know, choices also stood out to me in your work. Um, and so, you know, Lucy t seems to be sort of more of the type that's like, look, this is just my situation, right? I'm, I have, my choice is to make the best, right, of what we all might think of as like a generously complicated situation. Um, whereas Jephthah, it seems like, is more in this place of um, knowing what he needs to do to belong and to make his relationship with Lucy work and to overcome right the legacy of the Taylor name but seems at times unwilling and at times incapable of making those choices so yeah so talk to me about sort of how you went about sort of crafting right that sort of complexity mm, um you know I think for Jephthah he you know I think in those moments when he really does want to be better and do better um but just can't I mean I think um you know, he's an alcoholic. That is a, um, a disease. It is a, um, an issue that um, to, um, become, <laughs> become that other version of yourself, you know, and he knows it's not like he doesn't is, is making bad choices and, and making mistakes. He certainly knows um, and wants deeply to do, to do talks about, he feels like he's, um, he's kind of on the edge of a sinkhole sort of clinging to the boots on the side and i think that's kind of how his life feels a little bit to him all the time even when he's doing well he still feels like he's just barely he's pulled himself up he's still sitting there um and for lucy i mean i think i think she, she's just sort of going to make the best of the of the hand that she's been given um and keep trying to work towards um making her life um, he um, makes decisions at the end um, because she thinks this is going to be the end um, and maybe waits too long. <laughs> um, but I, I just think, you know, it's sort of, she's and it's, it's trying to make the best of a really bad, bad situation and, and do what she can. Um, very, very important for them and, and just sort of choice and the inability to make choice, I guess. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and so Molly, like I, you know, I said a minute ago, um, very, it was a fascinating character to me because again, I don't know what I thought a person sort of falling under this way of a cult would be like, um, but there were, what stood out to me were there were these real moments in this story where she very intentionally was like, this is what the cult needs me to believe. This is what the cult needs me to do in behavior. And I recognize that it's, outside of my values, but I want to belong so badly that like I am now making this intentional choice. So again, sort of talk to me about like, how do you deal with that complexity? Yeah, thank you for this question. I really appreciate it. That sense of her choosing to embed herself more and more was really important to me as I was writing it. I mean, I am one of my favorite books that I read while I was writing it is called Cults in Our Midst. The the Continued Fight Against Their Hidden Menace by um, Margaret Thaler Singer. And one of the points she makes over and over in the book is that anyone can join a cult, like anyone can be sucked in by a cult. You don't need to have some like big problem or something to be pulled in by this because they really appeal to deep human needs. So that on the one hand. And on the other hand, I was thinking about how um, Cult always means bad, a bad thing always, but there are certain kinds of communities and groups and activist groups that are, that have very similar structures, that have a similar sense of purpose and um, a tightness and an us against the world kind of thing. 
And for certain social problems, you know, a cult-like approach could be good, I think. Um, like if you just say it's a really tight, intense community with a clear leader or something like that. And I was thinking a lot about what, you know, Margaret Taylor Singer points to in that book, which is that um, the constellation, how you define a cult, there's maybe like 20 or 30 like things that lots of cults have, but you can have just like three of them or eight of them. The cult, it's a family resemblance kind of thing rather than a black or white. Um, so putting all this together, again, like with Barry, she, in searching for that intensity and also that connection to nature and so on, it is really hard to get what she wants in a conventional structure, living in Durham with her nice boyfriend and so on. Um, and so she, she does choose to be closer and closer to nature by any means necessary. And a lot of this was informed by a lot of time I spent living on off the grid farms myself. And there's so much that you have to give up to live like that, that, you know, from one view, you could say, well, all these people are like slightly crazy or from another view, well, what they've built is incredible and beautiful and, you know, all of us should aspire to it and so on. Um, so it is kind of like a, a many faceted thing. Um, and Barry isn't, I don't even think she's fully aware of that. She's kind of drawn in by the personalities around her. Um, but I, again, it's not, just as anyone can join a cult, many things seen in a certain light can look like cults. And, um, and yeah, that was a key part of trying to um, bring her world into being for me. Mm -hmm. And so Carter, right, one of the central conflicts with your work, right, was sort of Brian's struggle, right, with, um, either conform in these very specific ways um, and fit in, right? Um, or sort of be your true self, um, even in this place. And, and maybe it's something that's capitalized on by the fact that his life is coming to an end, right? So it's like, be who you are in your last days and suffer the consequences. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that Brian, um, you know, left his small town like so many queer people do um, because they feel that they can't be their true selves and because they're, you know, uh, oppressed and um, find community often in these welcoming and urban um, spaces. And, but I think with Brian, you know, I wanted, I think his background is kind of interesting too because he wasn't like he wasn't a kid who was bullied. Like he was kind of this really popular jock in high school. Um, and in some ways he did conform. He was kind of this golden boy. Um, but he, you know, felt more himself or connected to himself in these ways. Like, you know, um, what, listening to David Bowie or going around with his grandmother when he was little to say, sell Avon products, you know, um, where he could be sort of more free. And he couldn't do that around his, um, his parents, especially his father, you know, he just couldn't be himself around him. And I think a lot of gay men um, experienced that. And so, yeah, New York was everything um, for him and where he could be himself fully. Uh, but then and I think this is what happened to a lot of men in the 80s and 90s, and then everyone is getting sick, you know, you have this world and everyone's now dying. Um, and I think that there's still this kind of like, there's still a yearning. I mean, Molly mentioned that yearning, but this yearning to go home and to be taken in by your, um, your parents and that they should do that and they should love you and accept you. And I think he's still, um, I think he's trying to kind of give them another chance. Like, here's your chance to do this. Um, and, and, bear, and I won't, you know, give everything away in the novel, but I think some characters evolve and some um, don't. And yeah, I think you're right. There's like the intensity of him then being sick and dying and still having to kind of keep himself a secret for so much of, of the novel. And finally that, um, does start to to shift and I think it's because of um I think it's partly because of like Annie coming back and also his um little sister kind of evolving and, and grappling and and facing the truth of what is happening to him but also like the truth of who he, he is and to feel um 
that he can be that true self and be loved, you know. But not all the characters come around and, um, I, you know, I really wanted to push against that idea that there can be this kind of easy reconcilement in the end. Yeah. So I, of course, could talk to you and ask you questions all day. Uh, so, but we are going to take some questions from the audience. So just as a reminder for everyone, I already have some questions that have come in. If you have questions, type them into the chat. You can send them directly to me, Jason Herndon, um, and I will happily read them aloud. So the first one is for Elizabeth. I love your book, but I was surprised to hear you say that Jephthah was the main character. I read it as Lucy's story, but now you've got me thinking. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. I started out um, when I first started out writing the book. It was all Lucy's story. Um, Jephthah, I think I went through three or four drafts before Jephthah. He was in the story, um, but he didn't wasn't a, a point of view character for many drafts. And then one day, I, um, I, I wanted to write just him. I think I wrote a scene on on legal pad on a legal pad with um, him. Um, playing music and I just kind of fell in love with it. I think maybe because I wrote the best part of Jeff <laughs> the first time, <laughs> uh, not the worst. Um, and, and I really became really interested in his character and who he was and, um, and you know, I think his is, his is probably the character that people would say, oh, I know that guy. Yeah, no, that guy, don't go anywhere near him. Um, but I wanted to see if I could um, write a character that you would say that about, um, but then sort of come to love in the end, um, even though he makes tons of bad choices and does, you know, does bad things. I just, that you would sort of come to have some empathy for, um, cause he doesn't necessarily come across as the most empathetic character. So, um, so it became really both of their stories. Um, although it started just as Lucy's. So interesting. Next question is for Carter and it is, do you narrate your audiobook? Um, no, I do not. Um, but I do have an audiobook, and um, yeah, there are two great um, actors reading it. So yeah, but I do not. Okay. So this is a question for all of you, uh, which is, um, could you talk a little bit about what it feels like to write about sort of a beloved place that you've now left, um, and perhaps left for more urban spaces? Uh, Molly. Um, yeah, that's such a good question, and I've never been asked that. Um, it's really odd. I mean, I live in New York City now, and um, I feel all the time sort of why, <laughs> why am I living here when I really, truly love mountains and nature, and my family who's on this call can notice. Um, I'm, I go crazy when we go out on family trips into beautiful places. So, I mean, for me, a lot of the choices, I mean, I think this is really sadly true for a lot of writers' lives. Um, it has to do with how can I support myself financially? And, um, and so I think until, I don't know what would have to change until, you know, the rapture occurs, I'm going to have to not live in the places that I love necessarily. And, you know, also working on all those farms was I was even thinking, like, do I have what it takes <laughs> to live off the grid? And that is a a job with no vacation ever and figuring out a way that I can give myself the time to write and the space to write and you know the quiet and so on all that sort of combined together with the job opportunity in New York and um but I think especially right now with the pandemic and being unable to travel really um there's a lot of yeah I guess I always feel sort of separate from what I like the best a bit of constant sadness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious how the others will answer this question. Yeah, yeah. Elizabeth, how about you? I'm shaking my head in recognition of the constant sadness. <laughs> I mean, I think that's like the exile state, right? Like um, that you, you feel always sad for what you left behind, whether it was by choice or, or not. Um, and I definitely feel that way. I miss home a lot. I dedicated my book to Tennessee. Um, and, and it was, um, in some ways easier in, until a few years ago, right around the time when I found out that my book was going to be published, my parents moved up to Massachusetts because they just needed better, better medical care and to be closer to, you know, some family members. And um, actually none of my siblings live in Tennessee anymore either. And, um, and so that 
suddenly became very hard because it was always, I always felt like I had a home base and I could sort of claim I am a Tennessean because I always had a place to go home to and a physical home to return to. And, um, and I don't have that anymore. And it, it's, it's a, definitely a loss that I feel um, deeply. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, and it, I've noticed now in my second book is also set in Tennessee that I'm, it's, um, I need to go home to write it because I'm sort of, uh, starting to forget some of the tiny little details that make a place really come alive. Um, I was thinking about the passage you read, Carter, with the, um, the sound of the plastic hangers clicking together, because that's such a small detail, but so perfect for Sears in the 80s, because as soon as you say it, I'm like, mm -hmm, yep, I remember the sound. <laughs> You're just there instantly. And so I just, you know, I think um, one of the challenges about writing about a place if you're not there is just making sure that you um, you know, now we can't, but it, you know, when hopefully things are, are better that, you know, you can travel there and kind of remember those sounds and um, remember those small, small details. Carter. Yeah, I also like, um, I, what, what both of they said connects to me and um, what did uh, constant sadness, is that what you said, Molly? That's, yeah, <laughs> great. It was just kind of like longing for this other place or this place you left. But, you know, I mean, I haven't lived in Ohio since I was like 21. And um, I was writing this book when I was living in Portland, Oregon. And I think like uh, a part of me was like trying to write, um, I mean, it's a, it sort of is like a love letter home, but also fraught with a lot of tension for me too. And I think when I was writing it, I wasn't, it also felt like sort of a goodbye or I wasn't sure if I would go back. Um, I did end up going back to visit, but I think, um, yeah, I think as someone who's been away and made that choice to leave home, there is often, you know, I don't know, that yearning or, or just feeling sort of melancholy about trying to find, you know, my, where is my home? And so maybe like writing about that place is a way to, I don't know, kind of engage with that. And, um, but now I live in Kentucky uh, in Lexington and I live only three hours away from uh, where I grew up. And now, of course, like I deeply miss Portland, Oregon, which feels like my home now. And I like deeply miss New York where I lived for like nine years. So I don't know, it's, it's interesting to think about like where you live and then what you're longing for and then how that kind of takes shape in your writing. Yeah. So the next question is for Carter. Uh, how did you find Hub City um, or how did Hub City find you? Um, I found, well, it was kind of both. We found each other, I think, through uh, Wiley Cash, who is um, it's a fantastic author uh, living in North Carolina. And he and I were going to AWP, which is the um, big writing conference. And we had not, we knew of each other, but we ended up being on the same plane. I think we were, it was in Florida a few years ago. And he came up to me and had recognized me. And I was talking about um, my my book and um, we were sending it out and we just, uh, we weren't finding, um, you know, <laughs> we we're just getting a lot of passes and rejections. And he told me about Hub City and I didn't um, know about them. And so I went to their booth and we talked and then my agent sent um, the manuscript to them, like maybe, I don't know, a few weeks later, a couple months later. Um, so it's been a great uh, experience, Hub City. Uh, some of you probably know, but it's in um, Spartanburg, South Carolina. It's a very small press of only three people, I think, on staff, but they're doing an amazing job working to get this um, book out there. So it's been great to be a part of that family. That's wonderful. I'm supposed to ask all of you about your next book. Elizabeth. <laughs> uh my next book is is set in Tennessee, but um, partly, but is is definitely very different. Um, it's actually, um, uh, <laughs> I I spent a lot of time in my twenties um, writing about infectious disease in um, sub-Saharan Africa, particularly drug-resistant tuberculosis, um, and so I wanted to, but I couldn't find a, a 
I had trouble sometimes placing stories because people would say, oh, we wrote about tuberculosis last year. Um, and I was like, well, it's, you know, number one infectious disease killer in the world, but okay, sure, once a year. Um, uh, and so I, I sort of stopped writing about it nonfiction wise and, and started thinking about, you know, could I do a better job um, shining a light on this through fiction and um, thought, oh, well, um, you know, I'll, you know, there are occasional tuberculosis outbreaks in the United States, I'll set it here. Um, because a respiratory pandemic will never break out in the United States. Of course um, not. <laughs> that's what I thought. Uh, yeah. So, um, so it's, it's anyway, so it's a, about a, a doctor from East Tennessee named Alice who um, has left East Tennessee. She's living in Kenya um, and loses someone very close to her to tuberculosis there. So she comes back home um, and then this tuberculosis epidemic is um, is brewing and so she's sort of the person who's in the right place and with the right expertise to um, to fight it. So um, anyway, so we'll see how it goes. It's I love the story and have really enjoyed writing it. Um, I don't know that the world is in a place where it wants to read about pandemics. <laughs> um, so we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I think it'll be interesting. I'm very curious to see to read see and read right sort of the art that comes out of this time. Um, so yeah, I, I think it might surprise you. Yeah, we'll see. Anyway, it's been good and, you know, other ideas coming too. So I'll just, uh, if that one doesn't work, I'll put it in a drawer and, and save it for another day. Molly, how about you? What are you working on next? Well, first I want to say, Elizabeth, I would definitely read that. It sounds fantastic. <laughs> Very <you>. excited <laughs> for it to come out. Um, yeah, <laughs> my next book is, um, well, it's in some ways very similar to The Ash Family, but much smaller. So now it's just a cult of two. Um, it's an adultery story. It's a, a book about sort of like hopeless yearning for something that will never be yours. And I really enjoyed writing the character of Bay, the cult recruiter in the Ash family. Um, there's like a little bit of romance, but there's so many other things happening. And um, the second book is um, kind of this like, it's like a, um, the experience of being dizzy in love with someone you shouldn't be, I would say. And um, yeah, again, I, I've been thinking about it a lot this spring and wondering what the publishing world will look like in the near future. Um, and I, I suppose, I mean, like, ultimately, you just have to write what you feel you can write. So that's the book I wrote. Is the world, you know, wanting an adultery book? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> I think often, <laughs> yes. <laughs> often, yes. <Okay>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Carter, how about you? Uh, you all sound like you're so far uh, in the <laughs> project, which is exciting. Um, mine is still in the early stages, and um, it's a novel that follows these two brothers, um, and one of them is trans, this transgender man, and as he's transitioning, he is, um, they're twins, and he's looking more and more physically like his brother, and it's also about um, addiction, and it's going to take place in partly in Portland, Oregon, and partly in Kentucky. So, so but still very early stages. I'm excited to read uh, all of these books. So uh, yeah, please keep us all posted. Um, okay, so the last question that we have on this list at this point is, um, what are you reading? And what would you recommend during this time? Uh, Carter. Um, I'm reading, um, I'm like, I'm blanking on the name. My Autobiography of uh, Carson McCullers by Jen Chaplin, which is a really great um, book. It's, um, it's, it's sort of a biography of Carson McCullers, but it's also a memoir about um, Chaplin's life and um, examining the uh, Carson McCullers queerness and illness and um, it's, and her love affairs and her art, and it's just really great. So I recommend that. Yeah. Molly, how about you? Yep, just today I finished an absolutely fantastic book from Italy called The Eight Mountains um, by Cognetti. And it's, if you like mountains, <laughs> um, it's a story of um, a friendship of two boys starting when they're young and going into middle age, and um, also just gorgeous nature writing about the Alps. And a book that I'm really, really excited for is Luster by Raven Leilani. I think that that book has been getting a lot of um, buzz and that's next on my list. 
a okay. debut coming out this summer. Yeah. Elizabeth. Um, I just, I've been, I've been rereading Carter's book in anticipation of an event he and I are doing together in this coming week. Um, so I, I highly recommend it because I just love it. Um, I um, have been, I just finished uh, Sing Unburied Sing and uh, cried my eyes out. It was just absolutely stunning. Um, so it definitely, that one knocked me out. Um, and um, I recently finished Elizabeth Wetmore's Valentine that came out a month or so ago, and it was also spectacular. If, um, I, my dad's from West Texas, so um, it was really fascinating to read that kind of West Texas world. Um, and it's a very place-heavy um, book as well, and sort of dealing with family and um, and kind of you know the lives we make for ourselves. So it was it was really beautiful. That's great. I would highly recommend that you read uh, Holding On to Nothing, The Ash Family, and The Prettiest Star. I just recently read all three of them. They were all wonderful in different ways. Um, yeah, I also just started reading The Water Dancer by ta Coates, so that'll be the next book. Um, I want to thank all three of you so much for doing this. Um, I really appreciated hearing from you and I appreciate your sort of openness and your generosity with this whole process. So uh, thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful yeah. to be here. Yeah. So, as a reminder, this was a Greensboro Bound, a literary festival event. Um, please keep supporting Greensboro Bound. Thank you for supporting Greensboro Bound. Uh, we have upcoming events as well. Um, so please keep an eye out for those. You can find all of these books here locally at Scuppernong um, and in other places wherever uh, independent bookstores are selling books. Uh, so again, thank you everyone for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you.